Hello, everybody. It's uh, great to see you here so numerous. And you're very welcome to this new webinar series that we are launching today. We have some pioneers from our network that are uh, here with us. And uh, we're going to have a, a webinar series focused on our national reports. Um, now, let me just introduce a little bit for those who are not too familiar with uh, Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. It's a consortium of national country teams that are primarily associated with top academic institutions. And we carry out survey-based research on entrepreneurship around the world. And in fact, you may not know this, but GEM is the only research source that collects data on entrepreneurship directly from individual entrepreneurs. And that's what makes GEM fairly um, exceptional. Uh, just to give a very brief summary of what our research instruments are, GEM's Adult Population Survey, the APS, provides analysis on the characteristics, motivations, and ambitions of individuals starting businesses, as well as social attitudes towards entrepreneurship. And then we have a second survey, the National Expert Survey, the NES, which looks at the national uh, context in which individuals start businesses. Um, so this kind of gives us a very unique uh, set of data to reach uh, a lot of um, very interesting conclusions. And our idea was to launch a um, webinar series um, that not only uh, takes into account the global data, but also gives us an opportunity to compare and contrast uh, the national data. So um, in fact, uh, if you could just put up the uh, presentation. Um, here we have the key findings. Um, we're going to be producing the key findings from the latest uh, GEM national reports. We're starting with just three, uh, but in fact, we have over uh, 50 teams that produce uh, reports during the year. And uh, these are the three reports that if you could just go back on that, uh, Kevin. These are the reports that we're looking at today. Uh, the Egypt National Report, the Slovenia National Report, and the Col Colombia National Report. And to do that, I'm, I, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome our three panelists. Uh, if you could just change forward the slides, please. Yeah, which are, um, first we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Karen uh, Shiret. And uh, she is uh, the GEM Slovenian team leader. And she works with the University of Maribor Faculty of Economics and Business in Slovenia. Uh, then we will listen to um, Professor Dr. Fernando Pereira, who's with the GEM uh, Colombia team. And he is the leader of our team at um, the Javeriana University in Cali. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Professor Dr. Eman Ishmael, who is the GEM Egypt team leader, um, and he is working from the American University in Cairo School of Business. So, in fact, you have uh, people coming in on this from basically all over the world. Let me introduce myself. I'm Aileen Yonesper Summers. I am the GEM Executive Director. I am based in Switzerland, and I will be moderating uh, this, this uh, webinar. Um, so uh, to, to, to first move to GEM Slovenia, and I'm going to hand over to Karin uh, to bring us through uh, some of the uh, most, let's say I've always called these gold nuggets, uh, the most important and uh, relevant uh, findings from the GEM Slovenia report uh, in 2021. Thank you, Karin. Thank you, Eileen, for your introduction. Hi, everyone. So I'm having five minutes to present, uh, to present some basic findings or some most interesting findings from our national report. And I will try to use them as efficiently as possible. So uh, this year's report, uh, we have entitled Resilience of Entrepreneurial Activity. Slovenia is with the JAM community for quite a long time, 21 years now. And uh, we are a team of six people who are all co-authors of a national report each year. 
and Kevin, you can move uh, further. I will first give you uh, some uh, national background information in order to better understand um, the numbers I'm going to present. So Slovenia is a rather small Central European country. We are only 2.1 million uh, population and uh, all the entrepreneurial indicators in 2021 have shown a relatively favorable um, uh, state. And uh, But in order to understand this, uh, we need to consider some uh, macroeconomics indicators into relation as well. So uh, in 2021, we have a rather um, uh, 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 high uh, GDP growth rate. 8.1 is a very high number for our circumstances. This year, it is going to be around 4.2. Uh, unemployment uh, uh, has been uh, rising and declining in unemployment have been uh, observed. Inflation rose sharply, but all those happened because of the measures which have been undertaken to mitigate the consequence consequences of the epidemic. And uh, the country took uh, on considerable burden of the epidemic, which was shown in the high public finance deficit and in, uh, in the increase in the depth of the governance sec sector. But this is not going to be seen through the numbers uh, we have been observing within the entrepreneurial activity. So we believe that the downturn uh, uh, Colombia and uh, Egypt are going to be showing today are uh, something that we can expect for the next cycle next year uh, to, to happen in Slovenia. Next slide, please, um, uh, Kevin. So uh, Slovenia uh, will be presented here uh, in relation to uh, comparable European data. We are not going to compare Slovenia with all uh, countries included into GEM research. And I will start with TEA index, which has increased uh, in 2021 from 6 to 6.7. You can see the ranks uh, in the European and uh, uh, all GEM community countries uh, relation. But this number 6.7 uh, is for Slovenia, nothing new. In 20 year uh, cycle period, we have been witnessing numbers from five to eight. We have never had more entrepreneurial, early stage entrepreneurial activity. And um, this is, however, uh, the good indicator for, from our, for, our, for, for our circumstances. But we can gain a lot, a lot, a much more deeper understanding uh, of this number when we look into the distribution among gender and among age. And here we have been witnessing uh, some uh, very interesting findings never seen before for Slovenia um, uh, in previous uh, years. For example, in 2021, women, women exceeded the early stage ent entrepreneurial activities in two age groups for the first time uh, ever in Slovenia, namely in the group of, uh, uh, of young female, uh, uh, young women from 25 to 34 years and in the uh, age group uh, between 55 and 64. So during the pandemic, female entrepreneurs showed incredible resilience and resourcefulness. And this is also uh, the, uh, the, the, the topic I'm going to um, uh, talk about a little bit further on the next slide, but first, let me explain uh, just one uh, thing more. Namely, in 2021, uh, young men uh, were actually the ones who have contributed the most to early stage entrepreneurial activity. These are boys in the group of 18 to 24 pe uh, years. And uh, when we take a deeper insight into this number, we can see that uh, those involved uh, mainly in the nascent entrepreneurial activity so we uh, don't know whether those individuals will actually succeed in reviving their entrepreneurial attempts. And this is something for our policy take, uh, makers to take into account. Uh, next slide, please, Kevin. 
Yes. So we have been witnessing the increase uh, in the female entrepreneurial activity for the fourth year in a row. And this is very, uh, quite an achievement for Slovenia because in 2012, we have been ranking the last on a global level with this uh, indicator. And uh, for the last two years, we, ha we have um, uh, 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 been better than the European average. And this is something uh, we need to work on further uh, because we still observe the gap among the elements of entrepreneurial capabilities uh, where women perceive business opportunities to a lesser extent than men, feel capable of entrepreneurship to a lesser extent and perceive the fear of failure as a potential obstacle on the path to entrepreneurship more often than men do. So they do need a lot of support in order to transform this early stage entrepreneurial activity into established one where we have uh, 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 not so good results, around 30% of female in, uh, early, uh, in established uh, business um, uh, entrepreneurial rates. So I would like to finish my uh, uh, short presentation with uh, motivations. So Kevin, Kevin, you may go further, yes. And uh, give a little bit more insight into the motivation where again, we can see uh, those uh, trends I've been already talking about. Uh, I would like to stress the uh, motive to make a difference in a world where Slovenia have the significantly uh, better um, percentage uh, when comparing with the average in Europe. And uh, uh, on the other hand, we need to know that uh, female women and young early stage entrepreneurs are those who are uh, 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 most. Uh, most often expressing this uh, motive for their entrepreneurial endeavors. Other, um, other motivations are uh, pretty much the same in uh, other European uh, countries as well, but, but here and to make a difference in a world we can see the, uh, the, the, uh, the difference. And if we will have time further and going to go deeper into SDGs, uh, which we have presented for the first time in 2021, I will say a little bit more about that. Thank you. And I will give a floor to Colombia. Thank you very much, Karin. This is just really fascinating. Um, yes, go ahead, uh, Fernando. Okay, thank you very much for everybody being here. We appreciate very much your interest on entrepreneurship and having this opportunity to talk about our difference in, in, at an international level on entrepreneurship. Our Colombia case is a quite interesting one. Someone that is interested to look at how the context is changing and how the entrepreneurial activity is growing or decreasing. Colombia will be a nice case to study. First, we will say, we want to say that uh, we are a special team based on six universities and the National Office of Entrepreneurship that supports our efforts for the last three years. It is called Impulsa. So this is an effort that is uh, been doing by 16 years. So this is our 16 or 17 version of the jam. First interesting point, we have a nice context, entrepreneurial context for entrepreneurship. When we look at our NES, National Expert Survey, that is based on national experts, and we compare with different countries, Latin American countries, we can see that Colombia arrives to the first stage, first position, as you can see in, in, in the slide. And it's quite interesting because it is a way that Impulsa is understanding the impact that they are doing on the entrepreneurial context. So it is quite important jam for uh, national agencies and also for universities and all the stakeholders on our ecosystem. So first, Colombia context is doing well. 
And uh, that's the first big news. Not only. Next, please. And supporting this, we can see that uh, we get this slide showing how the NES is co Colombian NES is compared to international level. We see policies, governmental policies is uh, above global average and above uh, regional level because we have just recently uh, a new law that supports entrepreneurship and supports also special groups, minority groups. Uh, We're talking about uh, rural women entrepreneurs will get new support. And we just recently present uh, the results of our research, one of our research based on JAM, when we were able to differentiate and to understand more the dynamic of this type of entrepreneurs. If you are interested, uh, there is a version uh, that we can share uh, with anybody that may have a look. And also we keep uh, looking at taxes uh, that we still see that are, they are high. And they are, we have a new government, that, uh, national government that starts a few weeks ago. And uh, the first, new is, first news is that taxes are going higher. So we will, we will want to see what will be the impact in, this, uh, in, in our ecosystem of the, all these new uh, initiatives from uh, uh, Petro government. And in terms of programs, uh, government uh, entrepreneurship programs, we can, we can see that Impulsa is doing quite well and it's wonderful for us to have them part of our team. Next, please. But this is, this is the, the not so bright news. Uh, the intention uh, to, to start an, a new enterprise in Colombia is, is, is decreasing. And it's decreasing in parts. We can see that because we see we have uh, uh, that the recognition, the social recognition of entrepreneurs is decreasing also, and we have also that uh, that people is uh, have been very very hard impacted by by the, the COVID uh, experience. Uh, that is explained in part because we have a a high percentage of entrepreneurs are low value added entrepreneurs, which means that our services, personal services and all that, that were very, very high impacted by, by COVID. So uh, the, we, what we see, and we will see in a few more slides ahead, is that we have this uh, fear of risk, uh, risk of, uh, of not doing well when they start their companies, that will begin to, to, to have a negative impact on entrepreneurship activity. So the intention is decreasing and uh, the, the red light here, alert, red light alert here is that uh, we, what we will be happening in next years when we have this lower intention, what will be the TEA, the, the activity, uh, entrepreneurial activity. So next slide, please. And uh, as you may see here, we used to be a, a country with 20% uh, uh, of uh, total entrepreneurial activity. And in 2020, you can see that we jumped to 31% of uh, entrepreneurial activity, mainly because there were so many companies closed, uh, no offers of new jobs. So everybody was pushed to, to take an, an endeavor. Uh, but in the next year, that means 2021, the numbers uh, drop to a level of 15%. So this will be a, a good case to study in talking about how the context impact uh, the entrepreneurial activity, how the COVID impacted, and uh, we will see how the new uh, national government will impact uh, with these new uh, taxes and new uh, initiatives will impact the entrepreneurial activity. So thank you very much for having me. And uh, that's, uh, and especially uh, just to finish, this is a, a big red light alert. The established business owner 
uh, as a percentage of the total population is dropping, dropping very fast. Uh, so what shows us is JAM is a nice tool to adjust the national policies because we can see that we are having a nice support for new entrepreneurship or new entrepreneurs, new companies, but the established are, are in difficult situation now. So they will need, Jam shows us how we can also support this population, this of entrepreneurs that need a special support now. So thank you very much. Any question, I will be here. Yeah, at this stage, I might add, thanks for reminding me, Fernando, that um, you can actually put your questions in the Q&A area on the webinar at the bottom uh, of your screen. Um, please feel free to put your questions in there and we'll either um, carry, uh, answer them in the course of our discussions in the, at the webinar or we'll actually reply to them in writing. Um, so uh, yeah, keep, keep the questions coming in. That, that's going to be an interesting um, phenomenon to see how, 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 how you're reacting to what you're hearing. Now, um, we'd like to hand over to um, Ayman uh, to talk about Egypt. Thank you. Amy. Thank you so much, Shailene. Uh, and uh, this is very interesting, actually, to uh, put this in, in context. So uh, you all know about Egypt, but let me just start with a little bit of context about um, the, uh, the economic profile. Uh, Egypt's population now is uh, a little bit above 100 million. Um, the country has got an um, average GDP per capita nominal about three and a half thousand dollars and purchasing parity is about nine thousand dollars which is basically getting into a point of inflection of uh, kind of uh, middle income countries getting very close to that um, half of the population half of the economy roughly is in the informal sector uh, micro enterprises in the informal sector um, the country has been averaging a growth rate around six to seven percent for the past probably couple of decades. It goes ups and up and down with the different economic cyclicality, but that's been uh, the average uh, range. And um, as an economy, it's diversified in terms of the sectors. So uh, we've got a lot of uh, agriculture. Uh, uh, it's about one third of the employment, but only 16, 17 percent of the GDP. We've got a lot of manufacturing and traditional industries, but also a very large service sector that's about half the economy, which ranges from uh, tourism to retail to trading uh, and so on. So that's kind of the profile of uh, the country. And our uh, in the last report, we've been focusing on comparing the pre-COVID numbers in Egypt with the ones during the COVID. So this data set was taken in the middle of COVID, so it's showing uh, uh, the uh, transition. So uh, a couple of uh, or some key takeaways. Um, first, let's just start with the COVID and, and move out of that because it's probably uh, the least uh, uh, in terms of happy numbers, uh, we've got more than 80% of the individuals that we asked reporting that their income has declined and 45% uh, reporting that they know someone who uh, lost their business. And 58% of the business owners reported that they had to downsize the business. So you can see basically uh, the picture in terms of uh, a rapid decline of economic activity. And that's probably what we had during the COVID. A lot of these numbers have recovered in the last year uh, with the economies coming back and so on. Although we're having now impact from other global activities, whether it's uh, what's happening in, in Ukraine and energy prices and so on, supply chains, but that's a different universe probably for uh, the next iteration of our GEM report to look at. Now, um, some uh, uh, key takeaways on the uh, economy that we learn on the entrepreneurial activities and the economy that we learned from Jen. Uh, first thing, the uh, we have very high intention rates. So un uh, unlike the numbers that Fernando mentioned, we have some of the highest intention uh, to start uh, a business. Uh, around 57% of the population are interested in starting a business in the next three years. And this is usually, uh, this number has been consistent for the past several years, and it's usually ranking among the top three gem countries uh, up or down, but it's always there. And it tells you we have a very young population, more than half of the population is below 30 years old, 
and they're very interested now in starting their own business and the social perception of entrepreneurship is high and becoming better over time. So this is really good. Now, the challenge is when you look at this converting into the kind of the conversion funnel into people starting an actual business, the TA numbers uh, have always been ranging around 10% plus or minus uh, 3%. Uh, last report, it was 11.3%. Uh, so the conversion is low. And we're always facing the question, why aren't all those people who intend to start and are interested in starting a business, why don't they actually start the business? And the, actual is usually, the answer is usually in the business, the enabling business environment that needs to be improved and policies and regulations that need to be uh, opened up. So that's that's the first thing. Uh, a second insight is on the discontinuity rate. Um, we had a very high number of discontinuity rate. It used to be 5.6% of those reporting. Now it's about 8.6%. Uh, part of this can be attributed to COVID. When we ask people, why are you discontinuing shutting down your business? The top answer was market conditions and it's probably the COVID period. The second was actually limited access to financing. Uh, financing has always been there, but in times of crisis, it becomes more important because when you have a dip in your revenue, you wanna make sure that you have access to financing that helps you, this, uh, helps you continue in tough times. Uh, we're getting into another cycle of tough times globally. And I think this is a very important insight for policymakers to try and ease the access to financing to make sure these businesses continue in the challenging times, uh, which is very important for employment and for the resilience of the economy. Now, uh, a third insight on the innovation and technology. Globally, most of the companies that are getting into deploying new technologies and innovative technologies are the big ones. 88% of global, globally of big companies report that they're deploying new technologies and 42% of the early stage startups. In Egypt, it's actually the other way around. The startups, the early stage companies, and that's startups and SMEs across the board, 29% of them are deploying new technologies. You look at the established companies, it's only 11.5. So we have a huge gap in established companies actually modernizing, digitizing, introducing new technologies into their businesses. But we are happy that the new incoming companies are the ones that are bringing the innovation and technology to the market. And that's something that we should always think about supporting them because that's when you can actually digitize, innovate, modernize the economy. Um, a fourth insight is about women participation. Um, and this is a trend that's been continuous in Egypt for the past several reports. The numbers have not changed in any substantial matter. Only 24% of the new companies are started by women entrepreneurs. That's one out of four. And only 15% of the established businesses are managed by a woman entrepreneur. That's one out of six. Uh, if you look at the startup rate, it's lower. But if you look at the basically discontinuity rate, it's also higher compared to the male. Um, we know that there might be some miscounting because not all women who have a business report that they have a business. But we also know that these numbers are substantially lower than the global averages and that were what we would desire uh, to see in that space. So that's an area that we've always been pushing uh, for the policy side to try and improve these numbers. Now, that's the overall picture. If you think about this and put it in perspective, uh, we're having, especially looking at the ecosystem side, we've been having a lot of improvements in the ecosystem metrics. I won't go through the numbers right now, but they've been kind of gradually improving year over year for the past uh, five years. But most of the indicators uh, remain lower than the average where we would want them to be. So I'll stop here. Back to you, Eileen, and look forward to the conversation. Okay, thank you very much, Ayman. I think, um, you know, listening to all three presentations, um, you as participants, you get this uh, feel, I think, for the richness of the data um, that uh, GEM actually has, you know, because we can reach conclusions um, on so many dimensions of entrepreneurship and understand the impact of national context on motivations, intentions, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'd like to do maybe is just do a quick round, uh, starting maybe with you, Karina. So 
um, from what you have heard from the two other speakers, um, is there anything that actually intrigues you or that makes you um, sort of reflect upon your results as opposed to their results? Anything at all? Yes. Uh, I, I would like to uh, compare a bit the data um, regarding the youngest uh, within the TIA. Uh, for example, with you, Ayman, uh, you said that you have I, I'm not sure I understand correctly, so I would like to uh, that, that you explain it once more. You you said that you have uh, a lot of young population. You mean population in general in Egypt or population? Because I, I looked into the numbers and uh, within TIA, your uh, group of uh, uh, 18 to 24 and 24 to 30, uh, is quite uh, big. So you have a big proportion of youngest being uh, early stage entrepreneurial active. And on the other hand, you have been witnessing a decrease in ABO, in established business ownership rate in 2021. So I would like to know uh, what is, uh, so the, the reason for, uh, for having so much young people within the TIA is the population, or have I understood it correctly, correct? So yes, the, the population is heavily skewed on the younger side. It's a very young population. We have more than 2% increase in population year over year. Um, Egypt's population doubles every 30 years. So now we're 2020, it's about 100. Think about it in, in 1990, it was about 50 million people. So you can imagine the huge impact. And we would find that the younger generations are more entrepreneurial, which is typical everywhere in the world. So even within the uh, early stage, it is heavily skewed on the young population. It goes both ways. Yeah, that is very interesting because it's quite contrasting of what is happening in Slovenia and Central Europe, where we have aging population and exactly. the, the, the yeah. problems are, are quite different. So we, we, we have to stimulate our youngest to step into the entrepreneurial uh, path and uh, stimulate and give them support and uh, um, push this, uh, uh, this, this type of uh, entrepreneurial activity. On the, other, on the other side, we, we have an aging population and we are eager to, uh, to convince seniors to step into entrepreneurial paths as well. Yeah, and I think I think this is a very interesting topic because I think the world has got the the populations that are that where the demographic pyramid is getting into aging. Uh, Europe is big part. China is getting very quickly into that. Japan is getting into that. Uh, and then you've got the younger, the kind of where the pyramid is really skewed to the bottom, and it's mostly in Africa and a bit of in Latin America. And I think those two types of demographics have very different characteristics. Honestly, when when Jem was doing the kind of uh, uh, looking at how to encourage older people to start businesses, and they were asking some of questions, I was telling them it's completely irrelevant in Egypt. We don't, I mean, it, it's a very small part of the population and people don't even understand the concept. And I think that variation between the two different types uh, kind of leads to different types of policies, types of questions, mm -hmm. and different ways of interpreting uh, the demographics. And also the similarities between the countries, you might find a difference. So in Egypt, I would compare, it's not about which stage of economic development only, it's what kind of demographic pyramid we have. Those are the similar countries that I would like to compare to. And the same thing for Slovenia or other, or Colombia. Sure. Yeah, excellent. Uh, how about you, Fernando? Um, did you pick up anything in the other two presentations that e either intrigued you, surprised you, or you thought, oh, that's interesting and it's very different to what we have? Yeah, go ahead. Sure, sure. We're talking about different ages and different entrepreneurial activity. And also uh, answering Rolando, Jose, and uh, Joao Pablo that we're talking about, uh, and Gloria also. We're talking about the difference on uh, entrepreneurial activity depending on ages on entire and groups. And uh, we have in our report uh, and a, 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 a slide, a figure that can help us to understand. And uh, you can go to the Colombian report and uh, on GEM website and you can go profiles and then you can go to 
to the report of Colombia. And in page 92, 93, you will see that uh, the growing in terms of uh, activity of TEA, entrepreneurial activity uh, of different ages, where all of them take this big jump on 2020, uh, and especially the highest uh, level of entrepreneurial activity is 25 to 34. And the 50 to 64 years is around 10% uh, of the group has entrepreneurial activity compared to 18% of the group of uh, 25 to 34. And also in terms of established business owner, that is this red, red light signal, uh, we see that uh, the drop is very, very hard, hard impact in 45 to 54 years group. So they are dropping for around 2020, it was, uh, okay, it was uh, not a typical year, but it's around 8.5 till uh, 3.5. So we, we lost 5% of the population of this group in terms of uh, established business owners. Mm -hmm. So that will help us to understand that, uh, uh, and also uh, uh, well to understand that we, we need different strategies in depend depending on, on the uh, age of the participants. We used to have a national program, a founding program that is called Fond Emprender, Fond Entrepreneur. And they used to found only to give resources only to people less than 25 years. And when they begin to see uh, the gem data, they understand that this is the group that is not the, the biggest group in terms of entrepreneurial activity. The biggest group is 25 to 34. So they move their target or they take a bigger target to support not only the quite few, uh, young ones to the uh, young adults and, uh, group. Um, I, I'd actually, you know, all of you uh, pointed to very significant um, results as a result of the COVID-19 um, epidemic. I wonder, can you just give, give me a little summary of what your team experienced during that period uh, the difficulties, you know, that you um, encountered in terms of collecting data, um, how you overcame those difficulties, and perhaps maybe also what are the good things coming out of COVID? Because we hear a lot of the bad things coming out of COVID. What are the good things? So uh, let's kick off with you, Eamon. Um, I mean, in terms of collection, things were okay. We do um, uh, phone interviews. Uh, it's managed by a marketing research company that have the experience and things were fine. I think people were actually staying more at home, so they were easier to reach. So from that side, it was okay. Uh, I think the COVID was actually uh, a, a very weird period of surprise for everybody because people expected different types of shocks to the economy, but this I don't think anybody saw this kind of coming in this way. Um, the one really major good thing that came out of it is on the digital transformation side. Um, yes. I mean, we had the trends on digital transformation have been going there historically in Egypt and everywhere in the world. But I think this was really a point of spiking. People had to uh, contact their doctors uh, on WhatsApp to get advice. Um, and that changed the mindset about the whole healthcare sector and telemedicine, they had to order things online. Uh, definitely the logistics part had to be continue to operate physically, but but a lot of the shopping experiences, people who have not experienced the e-commerce now they have. Digital payments became uh, huge. The government was actually pushed to open up a lot of the digital payment channels uh, and increase their access very quickly. And a lot of people started paying things online, paying things using mobile wallets. So a lot of that digital transformation uh, started happening. Companies had to figure out how to get their workers to work remotely, at least for the, the types of jobs that could do that. And I think that a lot of this is not going back. Um, even if people start going back to the offices in different capacities and times, but the e-commerce and the digital payments and the e-health mm -hmm. and the, all of those things are staying with us. Uh, so that's not gonna go anywhere. 
you say, I mean, you say that that's a positive development. On the other hand, you also say that there's a disparity between the established businesses and the startups in terms of digital integration and competencies. Um, how, how, how much of a risk do you think that is to say the economy, the economy actually, yeah. I think it's, I mean, it, it's more of a pressure on many companies to digitize, companies that did not expect that. Uh, I actually wanted to comment on, on something in, that relates to this, I mean, that Fernando mentioned, which is about the uh, the change in intention and change in TEA and the support and uh, that digitization that's happening. When we look at entrepreneurs, in, in my mind, there are three types. There is the micro, there's the SMEs, and there's the tech enabled. The tech enabled companies are very small. I mean, I don't even know if we capture them in our sample or anybody capture them in any substantial way because the numbers are few, but those are really the drivers for the digital transformation. And we do a lot of separate research uh, qualitative and I work a lot with them and we're seeing a lot of push they are it's not that they are digitizing they are the enablers for the digitization of the economy working the supply chains uh, the micro and small we see ups and downs in their performance depending on the economy when the economy goes down we see a lot of necessity entrepreneurs so the micro goes up and it shows in our numbers has been showing historically the SME is the most important and really the challenged part. This is the core of the economy. This is the small companies that have 20, 30, 50, 100 employees. And those are the ones that are mostly challenged in digitization and they get challenged in the economy. And those are the ones that actually suffer from the access to financing wow. and uh, have really, this is the core of the economy and the most challenged ones. So I think that's, uh, we're seeing a lot of the policymakers talking about the tech startups and venture capital, but there's a lot less talk about the SMEs uh, and the policy and, and the DFIs. And I think that's very important to push and to get this to be the core of the agenda. Okay, thank you. That very comprehensive reply. And um, Karin, uh, would you be able to comment? I actually am going to introduce a little bit more of an extra element, a kind of future element, which is, uh, you know, the war situation that we have and you're in Eastern Europe and um, perhaps you can talk about the impact of the COVID-19, but also maybe look forward a little bit. At maybe it's hard to know what to expect, of course, but do you think that the impact on your data, on everyone's data, will be quite significant in the next year or two? Yes, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, we do expect those changes to hit uh, our region uh, for example, Slovenia in the forthcoming years, especially the crisis with Ukrainian war regarding the, the inflation and the costs that are going to be related with um, energy, oil, uh, gas and so on. And people are very are afraid of uh, the, the things that are uh, ahead of us, but our government is every day uh, we have a new government this year and uh, they are preparing uh, quite a lot of uh, new measures to help in reducing taxes, for example, for, uh, for uh, those kinds of uh, supplies. And we hope that we will uh, go through, through this new wave that it's not going to be easy somehow. But I must agree with uh, almost everything Eamon has been uh, telling us. Um, we, for example, with this, our new government have for the first time also the Ministry for Digitalization and the Ministry is a female uh, representative, which is uh, also something new uh, for our circumstances. So we are looking uh, forward to, to, to what they're going to, to do for uh, our 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 economy and uh... okay I mean that's an interesting I think this is a, a fascinating thing for people listening is that um, mostly the gem data and the analysis that we carry out is of use to policymakers above all and so we are very concerned that um, we extricate the relevance of our data for uh, application to policy decision making um, and I think that you had some quite interesting conclusions, Fernando, um, pointing to, you know, gradual slide in, in entrepreneurial intention. And um, 
So how 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 are your policy makers actually reacting, or how do you if you if you, if you if they haven't reacted yet to the 2021 results, uh, what would you be hoping? How what would you be hoping would happen? Uh, it, we were doing a great job till 2021. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the last uh, period of uh, our national credit. Uh, president, and uh, but now we are changing our context. We have a new president that is more uh, uh, concerned about the, the very uh, bad indicator of Gini. For example, the difference between poor and rich in Colombia that is very high. It's around 0.40 percent. So he will be more. Now, for this next four years, we will, more, we will be more interested on how to, to get some balance on that area. So that means that uh, higher taxes and all that, uh, that is quite different from last uh, period. We had uh, support of entrepreneurship based on uh, Impulsa, that is our national agency of entrepreneurship. And uh, they were doing a great, good job. So we expect for next period, for next years, to see how we can support not only young entrepreneurs, but established entrepreneurs. That means people that have more than 3.5 years old company. Because uh, we, were, we have a very big part of our population based on uh, personal services. That mean uh, restaurants, uh, tourism, beauty shops, and all that. And they will, they, this type of entrepreneurship uh, are uh, not very high value added uh, initiatives. So they will be very hard impacted with uh, COVID and the next pandemic that we may have. So the idea is how new programs to support this type of population to, to move on to new opportunities with more added value that can move from uh, just uh, this type of uh, low level uh, contribution. That will be one point. The second is uh, we are all the world concerned about uh, food, about uh, shortage of food and, and the level of water too on, on the countries. And, now we begin to see this initiative to support entrepreneurship on rural sites. So in my case, I'm, I am quite interested to understand this change of the mindset of the entrepreneurs uh, on the rural sites. You mean just survival or just for uh, low scale production levels to an agro-industrial mindset. Uh, so these are key elements that will push our, uh, what, we, what I expect, a push from our uh, national level perspective. And, uh, and JAM will be wonderful, it's a wonderful tool to try to, to show how, is the, how it's been changing for the six, last 16 years, rural settings and how are changing urban settings uh, in terms of women entrepreneurship, in terms of uh, intention. And uh, definitely our red signal, red light signal is, is for me, is quite scary because when we don't have intention, there is no action. That's clear. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. what, what we expect is the next two more years, we can see a rejump of the level of intentions. We are, we are very, very uh, expecting the numbers of 2022. They're just... We have finished our field work and all that. So to see how is, is it climbing or continues this declining uh, tendency. Uh, but it is, it is a, a, as one of the participants asked about, is this maybe a cultural problem? And we used to have in Colombia a region that is quite entrepreneurs. It's quite, it has a quite entrepreneurial mindset that is called Antioqueños, where uh, Maluma and all the singers that are quite renowned international. Uh, but this population is, is, has been 
last uh, one of their one of our presidents, one of the most recognized presidents, came from that region and was very hard attacked by attacked by a, a, a political area. So this population is is not uh, very well recognized. It used to be everybody wants to be like them. Now they are national level. There are a change of of values. Uh -huh. Of Young people yeah. expecting what uh, not not to take their their future on their hands. They are expecting what they can receive. That, that's that are changes that we are seeing in our in our context cultural context that we can try to understand with Jam. So Jam is the the results of these changes. So it's quite Thank interesting you. to have Jam to understand it's really, this. It's really fascinating. Um, I'm just going to go through a few of the questions at this point, because I will come back again to the policy making uh, impact. Um, but I, I just want to um, make sure that everybody knows um, that uh, we actually produce uh, the Gem Global Report. Here it is, you know, and, and you can actually download it from the Gem site. Um, and so we have a few questions here. For example, Rolando Porcini, who wanted to know more about the 55 to 64 group, how it behaves. Actually, you can find that out in the, um, in the Colombian report, but also relative to other countries, you can see uh, how that group behaves uh, when you look at the um, global report, because we do a comparison between all of the countries in the global report. Um, another one from Gloria Viscasillas, who says, can you compare the intention and motivation in the younger groups across the three countries? Indeed, we can. We're not going to do that right here and now. But uh, again, in the global report, um, we compare intention and motivation in younger groups across not only three countries, but also about 50 countries. Um, so, uh, Iman, I'll come to you in just a moment. I'd like to just get through... Uh, you can come back to any of these questions, actually. Um, I just wanted to say, yeah, I think somebody made a, a comment on whether culture influences, absolutely culture influences. I think that became quite apparent that in some uh, populations we have a basic entrepreneurial instinct. In others, it's not quite as strong and has to be stimulated, you know, um, by uh, also government governmental policy and education. In fact, one thing that's quite important to point out is um, across the board, almost every year in GEM research, we find that um, education systems are lacking in terms of promoting entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial mindsets um, amongst young people. So that's a really interesting um, I, I think it's almost uh, in comparing all the countries, uh, you find that that is lacking in almost every single country. And yet policymakers are not really acting on that. So an, an interesting one, if there are any policymakers out there, this is where you can make a difference. Um, what problematics will be important to analyze in the near future? Um, I think it's very important to tell you that we are focusing uh, to a very large extent in terms of the special reports that we produce on women's entrepreneurship. And we're also going to be focusing increasingly in the future on the impact of entrepreneurship on a sustainable world, really, the sustainable development goals. And so last year, for the first time, uh, we uh, included um, additional questions about sustainability, environment and social impact of entrepreneurship. So coming forward next year, we hope to have a, uh, a report on the impact of entrepreneurship on the sustainable development goals. Um, Eman, you wanted to come back to one of those earlier questions. Please go ahead. Thank you, Aline. I actually wanted to comment on that point from Thomas about areas that could be uh, further uh, studied. I think right. with all the disruptions in the supply chains that we're seeing, I think there's probably going to be a wave of deglobalization, uh, decline in international trade, and we're seeing that, but I think it's going to go a lot higher in the next few years, uh, whether it's trade with China, trade um, globally, and so on. 
Um, and this is going to be very interesting because when you are reducing uh, globalization, you're also reducing imports and trade, but it's opening opportunities for local and regional entrepreneurs to grow at the expense of large established conglomerates that are doing the international trade. So I think it would be very interesting. It's not something to start looking at to, today, but I think it would be very interesting trends um, that we would see and would be very interested to study if some of the startups are actually doing things that were previously imported and traded, but now because of whatever uh, geopolitics, they are producing it locally and how is that going to affect the entrepreneurs? So um, just a, a thought for the future. Thank you. Ayin. Thank you very much. I, I'd like to go back to my original question, Karine, on impact on policymakers and whether yeah. you might be able to comment on that particular question yourself. Yes, sure. Uh, sure. I, I would like to stress that in Slovenia, our uh, policymakers uh, were always uh, very eager to uh, look to our results and uh, use them. Uh, as well as when creating the strategic documents, as well as in the implementation of policy programs. And I need to stress that not only the Ministry of the, of the Economy, which is our sponsor and who finances the GEM research in Slovenia, but also the Ministry for Education, for example, extensively uses our data. And uh, this year they have started a national pilot project uh, in order to um, somehow um, uh, close the gap between what are the needs of the enterprises and uh, on the other side, what educational system is offering to our students in the terms of sustainability aspects. And it was quite interesting for us to see that, for example, Slovenia scored the best in Europe in, in terms of um, taking into account environmental and social aspects when we are asking early stage entrepreneurs. But on the other hand, when we are asking them about the measures, measures which they have really been implemented, we uh, have much uh, uh, um, worse, the wor worse results or, or bad results with this respect. And uh, also I can see that uh, Fernando is from the institution being ACSB accredited. Our, our faculty is also ACSB accredited and uh, with our accreditators, we also have um, a very um, uh, strong conversation around those, those kind of, of topics. Uh, so integrating the sustainability aspects into the education system and uh, making those awareness in, in younger, in young, in young population in order to perform later when being active in, in uh, enterprises and follow those, those kind of uh, goals we all need to follow. Okay, well, thank you very much, Karine. Now we're actually finishing the discussion on an, on an up note there, I think. <laughs> so uh, always good to finish on a positive note. Um, I actually saw that uh, some of the questions were actually responded to. So thank you very much, uh, Eamon, Fernando, Karine, or even Kevin. You know, if you responded to those questions, that's really great. Um, we'll have a look at the remaining questions, see if there's anything that we did not respond to, and we'll make sure to get back to you. Um, I'd just like to sort of remind you, if you've enjoyed this, you have an opportunity to listen to another three um, uh, national report heroes. <laughs> um, Maribel Guerrero from Gem Chile, uh, Kalma Gorman from Gem Ireland, and Ingus uh, Baumacher Falcon and Natania Mayer from Gem uh, South Africa. Uh, they will be joining us on the 20th of September at three o'clock. And we very much look forward to that. For uh, Again, uh, very much a kind of compare and contrast. And what are the golden nuggets, as I call them, of their actual research. And if we can just turn to the last slide. Um, again, if anything here, I saw that there was at least one person in the questions who was saying, I, I would really like to carry out a study like this in our country. Well, uh, have a look at um, who is a national team, uh, where there is a national team, and uh, perhaps connect with us and see how you might actually join the consortium if there is no um, national team in your country. So here are all the, um, the different uh, uh, contact points. Um,
please take note. And uh, yes, especially consider joining GEM as a national team if you're a researcher out there who's very interested in our research. And then we're always, always uh, interested in uh, interesting new partnerships and sponsors. So thank you very much for listening to us today. And I really have to thank uh, mostly Eamon, Karin, Fernando, and Kevin especially for setting all this up. Thank you so much. And um, I hope it's been interesting. And thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen, for hosting us. And Kevin. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.